we are going to be talking a little bit about sprayer calibration. And I want, I'm not going to delve deep into that because uh, specifically of how you're calibrating your sprayer, but maybe some of the variables that you can adjust while calibrating to make those applications better. Now, when we're talking $10, $15 an application, I want to make every one of those dollars count when I can. Uh, and sometimes the breakdown is not the quality of the chemistry, but it's oftentimes the how we're applying it. And so we got to make sure that those chemistries that we're purchasing are both going out correctly, the correct rate, and that they're getting the coverage we need. Now, the exception to that being what Dr. Lorenz just talked about is sometimes in this example with the new virus potential, we may not need as quite, quite as good a coverage as we have in the past. And so there may be some exceptions to that in the future. But for most of the chemistries we're working with today that we're recommending today, that's going to be critical. So why calibrate? Well, a lot of them, uh, the chemistries, uh, if you look on those sheets that were sent out earlier, particularly the insecticides, go out at a rate of one ounce per acre or less, even a half ounce, some of them. That's the equivalent of putting or trying to apply a heaping tablespoon of salt or sugar or whatever, whatever uh, um, powder that you'd like to, 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 to consider here and spread that over an entire football field evenly. Now try imagine doing that without using your spray equipment, right? That's pretty incredible the, what you're, the chemistry that you're doing in the field and doing that to the efficacy level that we get. You also see how that can fall apart pretty quickly when we've got either clogged nozzles or our speed's off. We don't have enough water in the tank or the wind's blowing too hard, right? We see where these applications start falling apart. And so let's look at some of those application variables quickly and how we can adjust these going from maybe instead of a graze-on application that may have held up just fine with that sprayer to now we're making an insecticide application. What do we need to change to have the same level of efficacy with that application and that, that new product? So we're going to take a look at uh, adjusting your swath width. Most of you probably, I would guess, are using a boomless type sprayer or some type of boomless sprayer. Uh, we're going to look at equipment speed and how to measure that, and then at your nozzle flow from those boomless, boomless sprayers. And so let's just start taking a look here at swath width. Swath width uh, on a boomless sprayer is not actually going to be your, your measured or observed swath width. You know, a lot of the labels uh, for these nozzles will say, well, as long as you've got 40 PSI hitting that nozzle, it's spraying 52 feet wide, right? You can think of your sprayer, does your sprayer spray actually 52 feet wide? Very rarely, right? Most of those nozzles, we say, as a general recommendation, we calibrate on basically a 30% overlap. So that would be taking this boomless nozzle in this example here, we measure how wide it's actually spraying. We multiply it by 0.7, which would take about 70%, leaving the 30% for overlap. And that, generally speaking, for most of our herbicides, is going to do a decent job. In an insecticide application, we've got to take it a step further, uh, and we generally recommend more like 50% overlap, basically hitting every part of that field twice. Okay. If we're not making that transition with some of these boomless sprayers, you're going to see streaks in your field of efficacy. And you may be seeing some of that in your herbicides as well, some of them. If you can think of some of our contact-based herbicides that require lots and lots of coverage, the pastoras, the, um, uh, what's some of your other contact chemistries that we have trouble with, agents? What are we killing a Johnson grass with or trying to? Everybody step out. Pastor is one of them. And you know, most actually on the label, there's recommending on Pastor. If you read carefully on some of those applications, they recommend 50, 60, 70, 100 gallons per acre in some applications. Is anyone in this room putting anywhere, anywhere above 25 gallons per acre out? Probably not. That's because of the contact sensitivity of that application. And so keeping your swath width in mind, and we'll look at this, an example here in a second, is going to go a long ways, a uh, long ways towards that. Swath width on a boomless sprayer is also very closely tied to droplet size. Now what, the, what I'm referring to here is, is ba basically uh, each of these chemistries are going to have a droplet size uh, that the chemistry is going to work most effectively at because of how much it's got to be spread out on that leaf or the 
uh, coverage that it requires. As an example, if you spray uh, a, a systemic chemistry like Grazon, you can go out with a much, much larger droplet because it's a systemic herbicide. Whereas you move with most contact insecticides and they're gonna require a much smaller droplet, that smaller droplet provides much, much higher coverage. These are, are, are mathematical representations, and so this is not 100% accurate, but I wanna show you the comparison here of a 100 micron fine droplet spectrum, assuming, and here's what's incorrect, assuming all droplets are the exact same size and 100% of them made it to their intended target. And you know that both of those are incorrect, but we can't do the math without making those assumptions. In this example here, we've got 12,600 drops on the left, and if you move the exact same 10 gallons per acre in the field up to a larger droplet size here, which this is about an 800 micron, so eight fold increase, it drops 12,600 drops down to 22 per square inch, okay? Now you would never intentionally go out and put an insecticide out with this size droplet, at least particularly a contact based chemistry because you need better coverage than that. But in reality, that's exactly what we're doing with our boomless sprayers. The middle of the sprayer has a much, much finer droplet pattern. And as you move further and further out, what do the droplets get? Larger, right? The wind has either stripped the smaller droplets out of the pattern, or the only droplets that have the momentum to carry out 10 or 15 away, feet away from the sprayer are those larger droplets. And so the reality is, is a lot of times we're going out with our boomless sprayers, putting this size droplets in the middles, and these on the extremes, and we have these streaks of efficacy because these contact products may or may not make contact with their intended target. So how do we fix that? The best thing you could do is use a boom. And everybody in Zoom world and here in this room can yell at me, right? Because we're, are, we, are we using booms, generally speaking, in our pastures? Okay, good, that's awesome if you can. There's, are, there, are all pastures in the state of Arkansas, can we use a boom? No, why? We've got trees, stumps, ditches, fences, telephone poles. We've got all kinds of issues in the field that don't allow for the booms to go out and to come back in one piece, right? So we've got to take that in consideration. And so we, oftentimes we select equipment uh, that's not a boom. Just as a, let's, let's say it's our, our ideal application. What does that look like with a boom? With a boom sprayer, we're getting a, typically 90 to 100% overlap of those nozzles based on the spacing. These are sprayed uh, droplet cards, that, uh, water sensitive paper, so that basically we can run over an application with, uh, spraying these cards and it gives us a very good representation of the coverage that we got uh, in that application. And so I'm gonna look at three examples, this being the first with a boom. Uh, and this comes from data we've got at the Livestock and Forestry Research Station up at Batesville. We've got a sprayer set up with three different sprayers set up on one uh, one piece of equipment, a flip of a switch, an applicator can flip flop back and forth between a boom and two different styles of boomless nozzles, and I'll share that data with you as we move through the presentation. Uh, and so, but this is kind of your gold standard application. We get excellent coverage with a boom, and then we also get excellent efficacy. This is showing uh, the white line here is actually going to be, on each of these examples, is going to be the meeting passes of those sprayers. So the sprayer drove down the yellow line on the right, and then uh, come back on this other side, this would be the meeting edge of, that, of those two booms. Okay, so we see clean middles on both, both of those applications. This is a uh, roundup on wheat killing off uh, in the spring, and then this is in the fall wheat coming up, they, they made an application before the wheat came up. Okay, so that's just, that's the context for this. So booms are gonna be the best way to go because of the coverage you're gonna get 10 to 12 gallons per acre is gonna be more than, more than efficient. In this example, we used 15, okay? So let's say we're not using a boom because of one of the, uh, the situations we listed earlier. This is probably one of the more common nozzles that's used in the state right now in those situations. It's called a Hamilton AgriJet. Um, and if you look, I'll zoom in just a little bit here. If you look at swath width here, Look how wide those swaths are. Somewhere between 44 feet for this nozzle and 58 feet. How many of you have used a nozzle of this style, top? Okay, are any of them running close to 60 feet wide? Nowhere close, okay? 
Generally speaking, I'm not very comfortable with any nozzle on the market reaching out much more than 12 or 15 feet and counting on it to do much, unless it's a very highly systemic product. Uh, the fall harming worm virus may be an example of something that, that stretches outside those bounds. But in general, uh, these numbers here are just to give the manufacturer something to calibrate based on. I would not go off of that sheet exclusively when making your calibrations. So, in this example we followed what we generally recommend, uh, which is a, about a f uh, 60 to 70 percent of your overall swath or basically a 30 to 40 percent overlap. So the example or the data I'll show here in a second or the images will be a uh, basically 40 percent overlap. This is on the sprayer I mentioned earlier with the boom. So this is a different, app, same field, same environmental conditions. All we've done is flip the switch to the Hamilton nozzle. Uh, 40 PSI, 15 gallons per acre, same speed, okay? Here's the droplet patterns for the exact same measurements we looked at earlier. So this is the center of the boom. We've got moving eight feet away from the center and then on the 16 foot edge. So we're only measuring 32 feet wide, not 50 or 60, but 32 feet wide. And you see the coverage that we got at that 16 foot outside of center. This is why sometimes our applications fail with these particular nozzles. And again, this is with 40% overlap. That card got hit twice, one from both, side, both edges of two different sprayers, okay? And then this is some of the efficacy results. Uh, maybe a little difficult to see with the lighting. But you can see what you've, you might have experienced in your field, several escapes, most of which are going to follow the line of where the sprayer's edges met. Those areas that even though that card got hit twice, you see a substantial reduction in coverage and therefore efficacy. This is, carries very heavily into, or this really carries well into insecticide applications where you're going to have areas of basically safe harbor for those insects that never got hit. Okay? So keep that in mind. All right. So what's an alternative? What can you do? Well, one thing you could do is tighten up your spray pattern, right? You could go from instead of a 30 or 40 percent overlap, you could do the 50 percent overlap. So if you measure your boom and, it, and it's, or your, your uh, pattern and it says or it shows that it's actually 40 feet wide and you had originally calibrated for 30, maybe cut it down to 20 and then all of a sudden you've doubled up again your coverage. Uh, now would that cost you any more in chemistry? Would it? It shouldn't. If you calibrate accurately, you're putting out more water, but you've got, your, basically the chemistry is diluted more. So the same application may take you twice as long and add twice as much water, but you're gaining the coverage requirements for the chemistry, yet still applying the same amount, therefore the same total dollars of chemistry. So something to keep in mind. Okay, here's another alternative. Uh, it's a hybrid system. Uh, that we've been working with that combines a small boom with small extender nozzles. You may have seen your county agents in, the, in your counties may have some of these setups. We've got about 10 or 12 of them in the state. And the way this works is, is again, you've got a boom basically however wide you're comfortable with. Most producers I work with make it just out uh, the flush with the edge of their sprayer tires or their tractor tires. So you're talking about an 8 or 10 foot wide boom that you're not going to drag off in the field. And then you install these extender nozzles on the ends. And so they're reaching out an additional 8, 10, or 12 feet on either side. And so you've got a 30-foot wide sprayer, but you're only 8 or 10 foot wide in the field. Okay? So in theory, that would work. Let's look at some information that might, <clears throat> might support that. Nozzles in this example are the same that we used on the boom earlier. We've got AIXR 110025s, a 10-foot boom that's no wider than the actual vehicle itself. And then we've got two of these nozzles accounting for 11 foot each side. Now they're spraying about 18 feet each, but we're again getting that 100% or 50% overlap uh, on either side. Same pressure, same volume, and then same speed. And here's the coverage we got. Didn't cost any more. It's no wider than the vehicle, just like the other boomless nozzle. But we got much, much better coverage than we did with our uh, that other Hamil Hamilton nozzle uh, basically without slowing down and not adding any more water. And so it's a much, much better system uh, in that regards. And then again, 
uh, efficacy in the field suggested the same thing. And so we look very much, those plots look very, very similar to a boom, even though you didn't have to worry about dragging your boom off or through the field. Okay, so, so very happy with that. Uh, okay, so swath with the take home there is be very realistic about what you're actually spraying. If, if you need to be spraying wider or you're not getting the coverage you'd like, maybe considering adjusting that variable to make your boom, you're using a boom, making your boomless nozzle narrower, or using a different style system that allows you to spray wider than you currently can. Equipment speed. Um, when calibrating, that's going to be a, a major factor here. I'm just going to show you a couple of tools that's out on the market that may be of assistance. If you've got a tractor-mounted GPS system, that's awesome. Uh, those are excellent systems as far as maintaining overlap, appropriate overlap with sprayers. They also, while calibrating, tell you an accurate speed. So you can trust that syst those systems uh, for your speed calibrations. If you don't have a tractor GPS, there are apps on smartphones that you can use. You just type in speedometer on any search engine you've got on your phone and it'll pull up an app and you can download th those apps and they use the same uh, basically uh, satellite signals to give you an accurate GPS reading on your speed. Accurate enough for calibration, so we're comfortable with that. And so use those. Um, there's one that's actually, if you, instead of typing in speedometer, you can write, it's, it looks like speedy, S-P-E-E-D-Y, but the E's are number three, so S-P-3-3-D-Y, and it's a pretty good one. All of these are free, and so use those as uh, accurate speedometers to calibrate your sprayers. If you're not using one, one of those two, and again, that one's free, so that, that's an easy one to use, but if you're not, uh, you can measure that and calculate, your, measure some variables and calculate your speed. If you're going to use this system, be sure to use similar terrain, so don't measure uh, climbing a hill and then, and then uh, spray a flat pasture and consider that an accurate reading. So try, get a good average between uh, hills and valleys when measuring. Use a half full tank of water with your sprayer hooked up, that way we can get a, an average load on that equipment for wheel slippage and those types of things. Be sure to maintain application speed throughout the entire measurement. So while you're, you know, started this first flag and measure through the second, maintain that speed throughout the entire or entire test. And then uh, be sure to measure multiple times to, to kind of weed out any inaccuracies. And so you'll measure distance. In this example, we're going to use 100 feet and you'll time it. And so we measured 100 feet, time it, and we ended up with uh, basically, we traverse 10 feet or 100 feet in 10 seconds, and we plug this into this formula. You can find this formula if you don't if you don't get a chance to take a picture here. Uh, or there's little spray cards that your county extension office has, and this formula is on that as well as another one I'll make reference to in a little bit. So talk to your local county extension agent, and you can get this information there. Uh, so in this example, 100 feet multiplied by 60 divided by the 10 seconds by the 88. The 60 and 88 are constants shows that this tractor was traveling seven miles an hour. So that's important information whenever you're calibrating. Okay, quickly let's look into flow rate. Um, the third and final variable you're gonna to need to measure when calibrating is your nozzle's flow rate. This becomes a little troublesome if you've got a cluster nozzle or a boomless nozzle because you're basically trying to, in, in the past I've seen folks try to bear hug a cluster nozzle with a trash bag and, and try to catch that volume. That becomes a little bit cumbersome, and I don't usually like grabbing something that's had a lot of karate through it or something. Uh, that's of some concern. So, uh, when you're, I'll show you a, a couple tricks on how to how to do that easily. Uh, when you're measuring, let the sprayer build pressure. So don't uh, cover it. Turn this pressure or the sprayer on and turn it off. It should be at full pressure the entire entire time you're actually measuring. Be sure to observe your pattern for any anomalies. Uh, I've walked behind a lot of sprayers before that's got a lot of streaking that's not built into the design. That's a good time to check that. Don't wait till you're in the field and you've got a tank mix already in the, in the tank. So check those anomalies while you're calibrating. And then be sure to catch all the flow for the whatever designated time for the system that you're using. Uh, in this example, so I've got a, that Hamilton nozzle we mentioned earlier. Uh, and what I, I do to catch that really easy is I take a, uh, a, just an old antifreeze jug of some kind and I'll cut these, these types of holes in it. So I'll cut the top off of it and then I'll cut a hole in the side of it, the size of that, of that actual uh, nozzle. 
and then you push that jug onto the nozzle, and when you turn the sprayer on, it basically acts as a deflector, and so all the product come, falls out of the bottom. You can catch it in a five-gallon bucket, and this does a really good job of, you can turn the sprayer on, let it build pressure, uh, observe the pattern before you do this, obviously, but then it allows you to catch all of the product uh, without actually having to bear hug a trash bag or whatever alternative that you may have. So that's pretty handy and easy to do. It gives you really good, clean, accurate measurements. Okay? So with those variables in mind, so adjusting those where needed, what, some of the easiest ways to actually calibrate uh, is using what's known as the, the ounce method. Now this is, I'll, I'll magnify this. These are going to be specific to your type of equipment. I'll show three examples very quickly. This is for booms only. So if you've got a boomless system, you don't have to worry about this one. But you're going to measure your nozzle spacing to identify how, what length of course you're going to need. So most of the sprayers are going to be, let's say as an example, about 20 inches nozzle spacing. So you'll measure between to, to verify that. So you'll look through here. My nozzles are spaced at 20 inches. I don't need to lay out a course that's an accurate 204 feet long. I would then traverse this course while timing it. So, and I'm going to, again, like we talked about earlier, measuring your time, or your, your speed, be sure to be at full speed while entering the course and exiting. Time it very accurately, best you can, and use as similar terrain as possible. Once you have measured the time it takes to traverse the course from the chart, you would then stop the sprayer, turn it on, let it get up to the pressure that you desire to spray at, and then you're going to catch using the method we mentioned earlier, uh, or others for boomless, booms, or booms is a little easier to use. Catch the nozzle flow for the time it took you to traverse that course. So if it took you 10 seconds to traverse the course, you'd measure nozzle's uh, flow for 10 seconds. The ounces measured equals gallons per acre output. So if it took 10 seconds to catch and you collected 10 ounces, that 10 ounces is direct correlation to 10 gallons per acre. It's always recommended to check more than one nozzle or check the same one multiple times for consistency looking for errors. Okay, let's look at a boomless option here. The math is a little different on here, so be sure that if this is one you're using, you didn't take a picture of the previous one. Same procedure, I'm not going to go all the way through it again, but your swath width, and this is your effective swath width. This goes back to how wide am I actually expecting that product to go. So don't look at the, the label from the actual nozzle. Uh, you need to observe this and maybe even consult with your local county extension agent to, to get, a, get a good recommendation on that. So if you, let's say you've got a nozzle that you're comfortably spraying 30 feet wide, then in that example you're going to measure a course that's 145 feet long, traverse it, all the procedure will be the same, except that at the end the gallons measured times 10 equals your gallons per acre output. That's the only variation there, so keep that in mind, okay? So you're welcome to take a picture of this if, if that would be help, helpful. You may already have a procedure that works <coughs> great for you, so I'll leave that. If you decide to use the hybrid system, it's a little different, and you may want to contact your county agent, or I'd be happy to help or swing by or, 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 or work with you and your agent if we need some assistance to get it done right the first time. But here's some tips on it. A hybrid system is a combination of boom nozzles and boomless, and you've got to treat those as separate sprayers when calibrating. So and the, 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 really the most important thing is to size the nozzles correctly when you purchase them. So don't go to the local hardware store and find one of these nozzles and expect it to work out with the boom you have. Let's design it correctly the first time. And then when we install it, it makes calibration much, much easier. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you're thinking about moving to this system over the winter in the next season, contact your local county agent. And if they uh, would like, they can call me. And between the three of us, we can figure something out to get you the parts ordered to do this correctly. This is not something you probably want to piece together from what you can find locally exclusive. Even though we certainly encourage you to buy locally, let's get the correct parts ordered. Okay, so treat them separate. And then uh, you basically, you could use one of the systems or the other to calibrate, I'm sorry, you would use this, the formula here to calibrate those two to make them uh, put out the same amount of volume. Uh, and so your gallons per minute flow that you, you caught earlier times the constant divided by the speed you measured and the width in inches for the boom 
and you can measure that in inches for the boomless as well, either way, but we're trying to tweak those variables to make it uh, the, put out the same. Now here's the, the tip, if you're going to try to do this on your own, usually you get the boom nozzles done, we mount the boomless nozzles, see where we're at, and we adjust the amount of overlap to get that volume right, is what we typically do. Okay, so that, if that it helps at all, but again, contact your local county agent if you're thinking about moving to one of these systems. Okay, so we've determined the sprayer output. We know how many, let's say 15 gallons per acre we're putting out. What's the next step? What are we, what are we chasing here with calibration? Trying to figure out how much product to put in the tank, right? right. So I get, that's the phone call I typically get is, I'm standing over my sprayer, it's a Sunday afternoon, the rain's coming in, how many glugs do I drop in the tank? Well, we, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we're there now. We know that we're 10 gallons per acre currently, or 15, whatever it may be. So now what? Well, if you know your tank volume, so how big is your tank, you can divide that by how many gallons you're putting out per acre, and that tells you how many acres are in the tank. That's pretty simple. Then you can take how many acres you have in your tank when it's full and multiply by whatever rate that your county agent has provided you or the label that you're referencing, and that tells you how much product is needed to go into that tank. So let's look at an example. Let's say you've got a 200 gallon tank. You've calibrated at 20 gallons per acre. This may be an insecticide application. We're trying to up our volume to get better coverage. So 200 divided by 20 is 10 acres in that tank. So every time I fill up this tank, I'm getting, I've got 10 acres worth of application in it. 10 acres can be moved right down to this formula and if, let's say it's a one ounce rate, as we've discussed in some of the products already this morning, 10 acres times one ounces, that means that every time I fill that tank up, I need to put 10 ounces of product in, mix appropriately, drive the speed that I calibrated at, at the pressure I calibrated at, and you're in good shape. And you're able to put out that one tablespoon of product per football field accurately. Best you can tell, right? If you can hold the steering wheel straight, right? And, not have too many skips. Okay, so like I said, I know uh, we're anxious to, to move, move on to, to something else. So I'll, I'll open for questions if there are any. Uh, but real quickly in summary, uniform coverage is critical for any applications. The best way to do that is always gonna be a boom. You're never gonna find a system that's gonna be as good as a boom, but you can get close with some of these hybrid systems. If you're gonna use any boomless, increasing the volume so adding an extra 5 or 10 or 15 gallons per acre can help in these applications. Increasing your overlap can be a part of that puzzle. But regardless of what type of system you have or your application, you need to be confident in how much you're putting out so that you're calibrated accurately. Okay? Contact your local county extension agent if you need uh, assistance or refresher on any of that with your specific equipment. Okay? What questions are there? Yes, sir. I see some with some boomless people. Some have the, the nozzle pointed up, some have it pointed down. What do you consider best? Okay, the question what the question was is uh, sometimes we see applicators that oftentimes will orient their nozzles in different directions. An example would be uh, spraying nozzles up in the air uh, or straight back. So um, it depends on the nozzle where we're talking about. Some nozzles are designed to orient in different ways. The one we mentioned already this morning, the Hamilton nozzle, I have seen applicators, that's designed to go down, okay? And I've seen applicators turn it horizontally so it's shooting straight back. The only thing I don't like about that is the de it's designed to provide a, a uniform pattern on the back of the nozzle, meaning that you can look down and see that across at that orientation. And so in general, I would recommend to use the product as it's designed, in that case, orient it the way the actual manual states. If they give that as an option, then that's fine. Every one of them is going to be slightly different. So look at, look at that, that, how they recommend to orient it. So I have seen that. That's what, that's what I would have to say about it. I, mean, I would be afraid of running a little thin some places. Good question. Other questions? That's my question. How much is it going to cost to convert to this hybrid system from what 
from a boom was broken? Okay, that's a good question. So uh, the Hamilton, as an example, I kind of use that as our, as our baseline because that, that agrojet nozzle is a very common one on the market. One reason is because for most systemic chemistries, it does a pretty good job if you got it calibrated right, okay? And then they're about 35 or 40 bucks. It's pretty cheap. If you're going to convert to this hybrid system, uh, it de depends on a couple of things, how much you can do on your own. If you've got some scrap metal laying around or an old boom already laying around, that obviously saves you some money. The end nozzles alone cost about $50 to $60 a piece. Okay? Keep in mind what that's going to do, though. If you're trying to get boom accuracy and boom-style coverage, you're gaining that 10 or 12 or 15 foot on either end without the headache of actually maintaining a boom, okay? And so keep balance that out. Is they're trying to sell you a boom without it actually being 10 foot boom. So those are a little pricey compared to other alternatives on the market, okay? So if you were going to convert, you would need those two nozzles, which would be about around $100, maybe $125. Uh, and then the, obviously the, the boom nozzles themselves, those are usually pretty cheap, 5 to $8 a piece. You'd need four to six of those. And the assorted hose, hoses and fittings, usually for easily less than $200 we can convert you. Some folks when they do that also upgrade to stuff like extra valves and some other options. If you think about it, if you've got a boom and the extender nozzles, you can all of a sudden turn everything off but one and spray just a fence row or just a roadside ditch and you don't have that option with all of your other systems and so you can add some other, other things that may add some extra cost.